This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush. Marquette, Michigan, January 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 5 The Marriage Feast. The morning's sun rose clear and resplendent, touching the foamy waves into a network of ruby-tinted light. The feast had been made ready on the second floor at La Reserve, with whose arbor the reader is already familiar. The apartment destined for the purpose was spacious and lighted by a number of windows, over each of which was written in golden letters, for some inexplicable reason, the name of one of the principal cities of France. Beneath these windows a wooden balcony extended the entire length of the house, and although the entertainment was fixed for twelve o'clock, an hour previous to that time, the balcony was filled with impatient and expectant guests, consisting of the favored part of the crew of the Pharaon and other personal friends of the bridegroom, the whole of whom had arrayed themselves in their choicest costumes in order to do greater honor to the occasion. Various rumors were afloat to the effect that the owners of the Pharaon had promised to attend the nuptial feast, but all seemed unanimous in doubting that an act of such rare and exceeding condensation could possibly be intended. Danglars, however, who now made his appearance, accompanied by Caderousse, effectually confirmed the report, stating that he had recently conversed with Monsieur Morel, who had himself assured him of his intention to dine at La Reserve. In fact, a moment later Monsieur Morel appeared, and was saluted with an enthusiastic burst of applause from the crew of the Ferron, who hailed the visit of the shipowner as a sure indication that the man whose wedding feast he thus delighted to honor would ere long be first in command of the ship. And as Dantes was universally beloved on board his vessel, the sailors put no restraint on their tumultuous joy at finding that the opinion and choice of their superiors so exactly coincided with their own. With the entrance of Monsieur Morel, Donglers and Caderousse were dispatched in search of the bridegroom, to convey to him the intelligence of the arrival of the important personage, whose coming had created such a lively sensation, and to beseech him to make haste. Donglers and Caderousse set off upon their errand at full speed, but ere they had gone many steps they perceived a group advancing towards them, composed of the betrothed pair, a party of young girls in attendance on the bride, by whose side walked Dante's father, the whole brought up by Fernand, whose lips wore their usual sinister smile. Neither Mercedes nor Edmund observed the strange expression of his countenance. They were so happy that they were conscious only of the sunshine and the presence of each other. Having acquitted themselves of their errand, and exchanged a hearty shake of the hand with Edmund, Donglers and Caderousse took their places behind Fernand and old Dantes, the latter of whom attracted universal notice. The old man was attired in a suit of glistening watered silk, trimmed with steel buttons, beautifully cut and polished. His thin but wiry legs were arrayed in a pair of richly embroidered clocked stockings, evidently of English manufacture, while from his three-cornered hat depended a long streaming knot of white and blue ribbons. Thus he came along, supporting himself on a curiously carved stick, his aged countenance lit up with happiness, looking for all the world like one of the aged dandies of 1796, parading the newly opened gardens of the Tuileries and Luxembourg. Beside him glided Caderousse, whose desire to partake of the good things provided for the wedding party had induced him to become reconciled to the Dantes, father and son, although they still lingered in his mind a faint and unperfect recollection of the events of the preceding night, just as the brain retains on waking in the morning the dim and misty outline of a dream. As Donglers approached the disappointed lover, he cast on him a look of deep meaning, while Fernand, as he slowly paced behind the happy pair, who seemed, in their own unmixed content, to have entirely forgotten that such a being as himself existed, was pale and abstracted. 
Occasionally, however, a deep flush would overspread his countenance, and a nervous contraction distort his features, while, with an agitated and restless gaze, he would glance in the direction of Marseilles, like one who either anticipated to foresee some great and important event. Dantes himself was simply but becomingly clad in the dress peculiar to the merchant service, a costume somewhat between a military and a civil garb, with his fine countenance radiant with joy and happiness, a more perfect specimen of manly beauty could scarcely be imagined. Lovely as the Greek girls of Cyprus or Chios, Mercedes boasted the same bright flashing eyes of jet and ripe round coral lips. She moved with the light, free step of an Arlesian or an Andalusian. One more practiced in the art of great cities would have hid her blushes beneath a veil, or at least have cast down her thickly fringed lashes so as to have concealed the liquid luster of her animated eyes. But on the contrary, the delighted girl looked round her with a smile that seemed to say, If you are my friends, rejoice with me, for I am very happy. As soon as the bridal party came in sight of La Reserve, Monsieur Morel descended and came forth to meet it, followed by the soldiers and sailors there assembled, to whom he had repeated the promise already given that Dantes should be the successor of the late Captain Leclerc. Edmund, at the approach of his patron, respectfully placed the arm of his affianced bride within that of Monsieur Morel, who, forthwith, conducting her up the flight of wooden steps leading to the chamber in which the feast was prepared, was gaily followed by the guests, beneath whose heavy tread the slight structure creaked and groaned for the space of several minutes. "'Father,' said Mercedes, stopping when she had reached the centre of the table, "'sit, I pray you, on my right hand.' On my left I will place him who has ever been as a brother to me, pointing with a soft and gentle smile to Fernand, but her words and look seemed to inflict the direst torture on him, for his lips became ghastly pale, and even beneath the dark hue of his complexion the blood might be seen retreating as though some sudden pang drove it back to the heart. During this time Dantes, at the opposite side of the table, had been occupied in similarly placing his own honoured guests. Monsieur Morel was seated at his right hand, Danglars at his left, while, at a sign from Edmund, the rest of the company ranged themselves as they found it most agreeable. Then they began to pass around the dusky piquant Aralesian sausages and lobsters in their dazzling red cuirasses, prawns of large size and brilliant color, the echinus with its prickly outside and dainty morsel within, the Clovis, esteemed by the epicures of the South as more than rivaling the exquisite flavor of the oyster, all the delicacies, in fact, that are cast up by the wash of waters on the sandy beach, and styled by the grateful fishermen fruits of the sea. "'A pretty silence, truly,' said the old father of the bridegroom, as he carried to his lips a glass of wine of the hue and brightness of the topaz, and which had just been placed before Mercedes herself." Now would anybody think that this room contained a happy, merry party, who desire nothing better than to laugh and dance the hours away? Ah, sighed Caderousse, a man cannot always feel happy because he is about to be married. The truth is, replied Dantes, that I am too happy for noisy mirth. If that is what you meant by your observation, my worthy friend, you are right. Joy takes a strange effect at times. It seems to oppress us almost the same as sorrow. Danglars looked towards Fernand, whose excitable nature received and betrayed each fresh impression. "'Why, what ails you?' asked he of Edmund. "'Do you fear any approaching evil? I should say that you were the happiest man alive at this instant.' "'And that is the very thing that alarms me,' returned Dantes. "'Man does not appear to me to be intended to enjoy felicity so unmixed.' Happiness is like the enchanted palaces we read of in our childhood, where fierce, fiery dragons defend the entrance and approach, and monsters of all shapes and kinds requiring to be overcome ere victory is ours. I own that I am lost in wonder to find myself promoted to an honor of which I feel myself unworthy, that of being the husband of Mercedes. "'Nay, nay!' cried Caderousse, smiling. "'You have not attained that honor yet. "'Mercedes is not yet your wife. "'Just assume the tone and manner of a husband, "'and see how she will remind you that your hour is not yet come.' 
the bride blushed while fernand restless and uneasy seemed to start at every fresh sound and from time to time wiped away the large drops of perspiration that gathered on his brow well never mind that neighbor caderousse it is not worth while to contradict me for such a trifle as that tis true that mercedes is not actually my wife but added he drawing out his watch in an hour and a half she will be a general exclamation of surprise ran around the table with the exception of the elder dantes whose laugh displayed the still perfect beauty of his large white teeth mercedes looked pleased and gratified while fernand grasped the handle of his knife with a convulsive clutch in an hour inquired danglars turning pale how was that my friend why thus it is replied dantes thanks to the influence of m morel to whom next to my father i owe every blessing i enjoy every difficulty has been removed we have purchased permission to waive the usual delay and at half past two o'clock the mayor of marseilles will be waiting for us at the city hall now as a quarter past one has already struck i do not consider i have asserted too much in saying that in another hour and thirty minutes mercedes will have become madame dantes fernand closed his eyes a burning sensation passed across his brow and he was compelled to support himself by the table to prevent his falling from his chair but in spite of all his efforts he could not refrain from uttering a deep groan which however was lost amid the noisy felicitations of the company upon my word cried the old man you make short work of this kind of affair arrived here only yesterday morning and married to-day at three o'clock commend me to a sailor for going the quick way to work but asked danglars in a timid tone how did you manage about the other formalities the contract the settlement the contract answered dantes languidly it didn't take long to fix that mercedes has no fortune i have none to settle on her so you see our papers were quickly written out and certainly do not come very expensive this joke elicited a fresh burst of applause so that what we presume to be merely the betrothal feast turns out to be the actual wedding dinner said danglars no no answered dantes don't imagine i am going to put you off in that shabby manner to-morrow morning i start for paris four days to go and the same to return with one day to discharge the commission entrusted to me is all the time i shall be absent i shall be back here by the first of march and on the second i give my real marriage feast the prospect of fresh festivity redoubled the hilarity of the guests to such a degree that the elder dantes who at the commencement of the repast had commented upon the silence that prevailed now found it difficult amid the general din of voices to obtain a moment's tranquillity in which to drink to the health and prosperity of the bride and bridegroom dantes perceiving the affectionate eagerness of his father responded by a look of grateful pleasure while mercedes glanced at the clock and made an expressive gesture to edmund around the table reigned that noisy hilarity which usually prevails at such a time among people sufficiently free from the demands of social position not to feel the trammels of etiquette such as at the commencement of the repast had not been able to seat themselves according to their inclination rose unceremoniously and sought out more agreeable companions everybody talked at once without waiting for a reply and each one seemed to be contented with expressing his or her own thoughts fernand's paleness appeared to have communicated itself to danglars as for fernand himself he seemed to be enduring the tortures of the damned unable to rest he was among the first to quit the table and as though seeking to avoid the hilarious mirth that rose in such deafening sounds he continued in utter silence to pace the farther end of the salon caderousse approached him just as danglars whom fernand seemed most anxious to avoid had joined him in a corner of the room upon my word said caderousse from whose mind the friendly treatment of dantes united with the effect of the excellent wine he had partaken of had effaced every feeling of envy or jealousy at dantes good fortune upon my word dantes is a downright good fellow and when i see him sitting there beside his pretty wife that is so soon to be i cannot help thinking it would have been a great pity to have served him that trick you were planning yesterday oh there was no harm meant answered danglars 
At first I certainly did feel somewhat uneasy as to what Fernand might be tempted to do, but when I saw how completely he had mastered his feelings, even so far as to become one of his rival's attendants, I knew there was no further cause for apprehension. Caderousse looked full at Fernand. He was ghastly pale. Certainly, continued Danglars, the sacrifice was no trifling one, when the beauty of the bride is concerned. Upon my soul, that future captain of mine is a lucky dog. Gad, I only wish he would let me take his place. Shall we not set forth? asked the sweet silvery voice of Mercedes. Two o'clock has just struck, and you know we are expected in a quarter of an hour. To be sure, to be sure, cried Dantes, eagerly quitting the table. Let us go directly. His words were re-echoed by the whole party with vociferous cheers. At this moment Danglars, who had been incessantly observing every change in Fernand's look and manner, saw him stagger and fall back with an almost convulsive spasm against a seat placed near one of the open windows. At the same instant his ear caught a sort of indistinct sound on the stairs, followed by the measured tread of soldiery, with the clanking of swords and military accoutrements. Then came a hum and buzz as of many voices, so as to deaden even the noisy mirth of the bridal party, among whom a vague feeling of curiosity and apprehension quelled every disposition to talk, and almost instantaneously the most death-like stillness prevailed. The sounds drew nearer. Three blows were struck upon the panel of the door. The company looked at each other in consternation. "'I demand admittance,' said a loud voice outside the room, "'in the name of the law!' As no attempt was made to prevent it, the door was opened, and a magistrate, wearing his official scarf, presented himself, followed by four soldiers and a corporal. Uneasiness now yielded to the most extreme dread on the part of those present. "'May I venture to inquire the reason of this unexpected visit?' said M. Morel, addressing the magistrate, whom he evidently knew. "'There is doubtless some mistake easily explained.' "'If it is so,' explained the magistrate, "'rely upon every reparation being made. "'Meanwhile I am the bearer of an order of arrest, "'and although I must reluctantly perform the task assigned me, "'it must nevertheless be fulfilled. "'Who among the persons here assembled answers to the name of Edmond Dantes?' "'Every eye was turned towards the young man who, "'spite of the agitation he could not but feel, "'advanced with dignity and said in a firm voice, "'I am he.' "'What is your pleasure with me?' "'Edmond Dantes,' replied the magistrate, "'I arrest you in the name of the law.' "'Me,' repeated Edmund, slightly changing color. "'And wherefore, I pray?' "'I cannot inform you, but you will be duly acquainted with the reasons "'that have rendered such a step necessary at the preliminary examination.' Monsieur Morel felt that further resistance or remonstrance was useless, he saw before him an officer delegated to enforce the law, and perfectly well knew that it would be as unavailing to seek pity from a magistrate decked with his official scarf as to address a petition to some cold marble effigy. Old Dantes, however, sprang forward. There are situations which the heart of a father or a mother cannot be made to understand. He prayed and supplicated in terms so moving that even the officer was touched, and, although firm in his duty, he kindly said, my worthy friend, let me beg of you to calm your apprehensions. Your son has probably neglected some prescribed form or attention in registering his cargo, and it is more than probable he will be set at liberty directly he has been given the information required, whether touching the health of his crew or the value of his freight. "'What is the meaning of all this?' inquired Caderousse, frowning on Dangliers, who had assumed the air of utter surprise." "'How can I tell you?' replied he. "'I am, like yourself, utterly bewildered at all that is going on, "'and cannot, in the least, make out what it is about.' Caderousse then looked round for Fernand, but he had disappeared. "'The scene of the previous night now came back to his mind with startling clearness. "'The painful catastrophe he had just witnessed "'appeared effectually to have rent away the veil "'which the intoxication of the evening before "'had raised between himself and his memory.' "'So, so,' said he, in a hoarse and choking voice, to Danglars. "'This, then, I suppose, is a part of the trick you were concerting yesterday. "'All I can say is, that if it be so, tis an ill turn, "'and well deserves to bring double evil on those who have projected it.' 
"'Nonsense,' returned Danglars. "'I tell you again, I have nothing whatever to do with it. "'Besides, you know very well that I tore that paper to pieces.' "'No, you did not,' answered Caderousse. "'You merely threw it by. "'I saw it lying in a corner. "'Hold your tongue, you fool. "'What should you know about it? "'Why, you were drunk.' "'Where is Fernand?' inquired Caderousse. "'How do I know?' replied Danglars. "'Gone, as every prudent man ought to be, "'to look after his own affairs, most likely. "'Never mind where he is. "'Let you and I go and see what is to be done for our poor friends.' During this conversation, Dantes, after having exchanged a cheerful shake of the hand with all his sympathizing friends, had surrendered himself to the officer sent to arrest him, merely saying, "'Make yourself quite easy, my good fellows. There is some little mistake to clear up, that's all. Depend on it. And very likely I may not have to go as so far as the prison to effect that.' "'Oh, to be sure,' responded Danglars, who had now approached the group. "'Nothing more than a mistake. I feel quite certain.' Dantes descended the staircase, preceded by the magistrate and followed by the soldiers. A carriage awaited him at the door. He got in, followed by two soldiers and the magistrate, and the vehicle drove off towards Marseilles. "'Adieu, adieu, dearest Edmund,' cried Mercedes, stretching out her arm to him from the balcony. The prisoner heard the cry, which sounded like the sob of a broken heart, and leaning from the coach he called out, "'Good-bye, Mercedes. We shall soon meet again.' Then the vehicle disappeared round one of the turnings of Fort St. Nicholas. "'Wait for me here, all of you,' cried Monsieur Morel. "'I will take the first conveyance I find and hurry to Marseilles, whence I will bring you word how all is going on.' "'That's right,' exclaimed a multitude of voices. "'Go and return as quickly as you can.' This second departure was followed by a long and fearful state of terrified silence on the part of those who were left behind. The old father and Mercedes remained for some time apart, each absorbed in grief. But at length the two poor victims of the same blow raised their eyes, and with a simultaneous burst of feeling rushed into each other's arms. Meanwhile Fernand made his appearance, poured out for himself a glass of water with a trembling hand, then hastily swallowing it, went to sit down at the first vacant place. And this was, by mere chance, placed next to the seat on which Mercedes had fallen half-fainting, when released from the warm and affectionate embrace of old Dantes, instinctively Fernand drew back his chair. "'He is the cause of all this misery. I am quite sure of it,' whispered Caderousse, who had never taken his eyes off Fernand to Danglars. "'I don't think so,' answered the other. "'He's too stupid to imagine such a scheme. I only hope the mischief will fall upon the head of whoever wrought it.' "'You don't mention those who aided and abetted the deed,' said Caderousse. "'Surely,' answered Danglars, "'one cannot be held responsible for every chance arrow shot into the air.' "'You can, indeed, when the arrow lights pointed downward on somebody's head.' Meantime, the subject of the arrest was being canvassed in every different form. "'What think you, Danglars?' said one of the party, turning towards him, "'of this event?' Why, replied he, I think it just possible Dantes may have been detected with some trifling article on board ship, considered here as contraband. But how could he have done so without your knowledge, Danglars, since you are the ship's supercargo? Why, as for that, I could only know what I was told respecting the merchandise with which the vessel was laden. I know she was loaded with cotton, and that she took in her freight at Alexandria from Prestitt's warehouse, and at Smyrna from Pascal's. That is all I was obliged to know, and I beg I may not be asked for any further particulars. Now I recollect, said the afflicted old father, my poor boy told me yesterday he got a small case of coffee and another of tobacco for me. There, you see, exclaimed Danglars, now the mischief is out. Depend upon it, the custom-house people went rummaging about the ship in our absence and discovered poor Dante's hidden treasures. Mercedes, however, paid no heed to this explanation of her lover's arrest. Her grief, which she had hitherto tried to restrain, now burst out in a violent fit of hysterical sobbing. "'Come, come,' said the old man. "'Be comforted, my poor child. There is still hope.' "'Hope,' repeated Danglars. "'Hope,' faintly murmured Ferdinand, but the word seemed to die away on his pale, agitated lips, and a convulsive spasm passed over his countenance." "'Good news! Good news!' shouted forth one of the party stationed in the balcony on the lookout. 
Here comes Monsieur Morel back. No doubt now we shall hear that our friend is released. Mercedes and the old man rushed to meet the shipowner and greeted him at the door. He was very pale. What news? exclaimed a general burst of voices. Alas, my friends, replied Monsieur Morel with a mournful shake of his head. The thing has assumed a more serious aspect than I expected. Oh, indeed, indeed, sir, he is innocent, sobbed forth Mercedes. That I believe, answered Monsieur Morel, but still he is charged. With what? inquired the elder Dantes. With being an agent of the Bonapartist faction. Many of our readers may be able to recollect how formidable such an accusation became in the period at which our story is dated. A despairing cry escaped the pale lips of Mercedes. The old man sank into a chair. "'Ah, Danglars,' whispered Caderousse, "'you have deceived me. The trick you spoke of last night has been played. But I cannot suffer a poor old man or an innocent girl to die of grief through your fault. I am determined to tell them all about it.' "'Be silent, you simpleton,' cried Danglars, grasping him by the arm, "'or I will not answer even for your own safety. "'Who can tell whether Dantes be innocent or guilty? "'The vessel did touch at Elba, where he quitted it, "'and passed a whole day in the island. "'Now should any letters or other documents "'of a compromising character be found upon him, "'will it not be taken for granted "'that all who uphold him are his accomplices?' With the rapid instinct of selfishness, Caderousse readily perceived the solidarity of this mode of reasoning. He gazed doubtfully, wistfully on Danglars, and then cautioned supplanted generosity. "'Suppose we wait a while and see what comes of it,' said he, casting a bewildered look on his companion. "'To be sure,' answered Danglars. "'Let us wait, by all means. If he be innocent, of course he will be set at liberty. If guilty, why, it is no use involving ourselves in a conspiracy.' "'Let us go, then. I cannot stay here any longer.' "'With all my heart,' replied Danglars, pleased to find the other so tractable, "'let us take ourselves out of the way, and leave things for the present to take their course.' After their departure, Fernand, who had now again become the friend and protector of Mercedes, led the girl to her home, while the friends of Dante's conducted the now half-fainting man back to his abode." The rumor of Edmund's arrest as a Bonapartist agent was not slow in circulating throughout the city. "'Could you ever have credited such a thing, my dear Danglars?' asked M. Morel, as, on his return to the port, for the purpose of gleaning fresh tidings of Dante's from M. de Villefort, the assistant procureur, he overtook his supercargo in Caderousse. "'Could you have believed such a thing possible?' "'Why, you know I told you,' replied Danglars, "'that I considered the circumstance of his having anchored at the island of Elba "'as a very suspicious circumstance. "'And did you mention these suspicions to any person besides myself?' "'Certainly not,' returned Danglars, then added in a low whisper, "'You understand that, on account of your uncle, Monsieur Policar Morel, "'who served under the other government, "'and who does not altogether conceal what he thinks on the subject, "'you are strongly suspected of regretting the abdication of Napoleon. "'I should have feared to injure both Edmund and yourself "'had I divulged my own apprehensions to a soul.' I am too well aware that, though a subordinate like myself is bound to acquaint the shipowner with everything that occurs, there are many things he ought most carefully to conceal from all else. "'Tis well, Danglais, tis well,' replied M. Morel. "'You are a worthy fellow, and I had already thought of your interests in the event of poor Edmund having become captain of the Ferron. "'Is it possible you were so kind?' "'Yes, indeed. I had previously inquired of Dante's what was his opinion of you, and if he should have any reluctance to continue you in your post, for somehow I have perceived a sort of coolness between you.' "'And what was his reply?' "'That he certainly did think he had given you offence in an affair which he merely referred to without entering into particulars, but that whoever possessed the good opinion and confidence of the ship's owner would have his preference also.' "'The hypocrite!' murmured Danglars. "'Poor Dantes,' said Caderousse. "'No one can deny his being a noble-hearted young fellow.' "'But meanwhile,' continued M. Morel, "'here is the Ferron without a captain.' "'Oh,' replied Danglars, "'since we cannot leave this port for the next three months, "'let us hope that, ere the expiration of that period, "'Dantes will be set at liberty.' "'No doubt. But in the meantime?' 
"'I am entirely at your service, Monsieur Morel,' answered Danglars. "'You know that I am as capable of managing a ship as the most experienced captain in the service, and it will be so far advantageous to you to accept my services that upon Edmund's release from prison no further charge will be requisite on board the Ferran than for Dantes and myself each to resume our respective posts.' "'Thanks, Danglars. That will smooth over all difficulties. "'I fully authorize you at once to assume the command of the Ferron, "'and look carefully to the unloading of her freight. "'Private misfortunes must never be allowed to interfere with business.' "'Be easy on that score, Monsieur Morel. "'But do you think we shall be permitted to see our poor Edmund?' "'I will let you know that directly. "'I have seen Monsieur de Villefort, "'whom I shall endeavour to interest in Edmund's favour. "'I am aware he is a furious royalist, "'but in spite of that, and of his being king's attorney, "'he is a man like ourselves, "'and I fancy not a bad sort of one.' "'Perhaps not,' replied Danglars. "'But I hear that he is ambitious, "'and that's rather against him.' "'Well, well,' returned Monsieur Morel, "'we shall see.' "'But now hasten on board. "'I will join you there ere long.' "'So saying, the worthy shipowner quitted the two allies "'and proceeded in the direction of the Palais de Justice. "'You see,' said Danglars, addressing Caderousse, "'the turn things have taken. "'Do you still feel any desire to stand up in his defence? "'Not the slightest. "'But yet it seems to me a shocking thing "'that a mere joke should lead to such consequences.' "'But who perpetrated that joke, let me ask? "'Neither you nor myself, but Ferdinand. "'You knew very well that I threw the paper into the corner of the room. "'Indeed, I fancied I had destroyed it.' "'Oh, no,' replied Caderousse. "'That I can answer for. You did not. "'I only wish I could see it now as plainly as I saw it "'lying all crushed and crumpled in a corner of the arbor. "'Well, then, if you did, depend upon it. "'Ferdinand picked it up and either copied it or caused it to be copied.' "'Perhaps, even, he did not take the trouble of recopying it. "'And now I think of it, by heavens, he may have sent the letter himself. "'Fortunately for me, the handwriting was disguised.' "'Then you were aware of Dante's being engaged in a conspiracy?' "'Not I, as I said before. "'I thought the whole thing was a joke, nothing more. "'It seems, however, that I have unconsciously stumbled upon the truth.' still argued caderousse i would give a great deal if nothing of the kind had happened or at least that i had had no hand in it you will see Danglars, that it will turn out an unlucky job for both of us nonsense if any harm come of it it should fall on the guilty person and that you know is fernand how can we be implicated in any way all we have got to do is to keep our own counsel and remain perfectly quiet not breathing a word to any living soul, and you will see that the storm will pass away without in the least affecting us. Amen, responded Caderousse, waving his hand in token of adieu to Danglars, and bending his steps towards the Allées du Milien, moving his head to and fro, and muttering as he went, after the manner of one whose mind was overcharged with one absorbing idea. So far, then, said Danglars mentally, all has gone as I would have it. I am temporarily commander of the Ferion, with the certainty of being permanently so, if that fool of a Caderousse can be persuaded to hold his tongue. My only fear is the chance of Dante's being released. But there he is in the hands of justice, and, admitted he with a smile, she will take her own. So saying, he leaped into a boat, desiring to be rowed on board the Ferion, where Monsieur Morel had agreed to meet him. End of chapter 5。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J.C. Guan, Montreal, May 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 6. THE DEPUTY PROCUREUR DU ROI In one of the aristocratic mansions built by Puget in the Rue du Grand Cour opposite the Medusa Fountain, a second marriage feast was being celebrated, almost at the same hour with the nuptial repast given by Dantes. In this case, however, although the occasion of the entertainment was similar, the company was strikingly dissimilar. 
instead of a rude mixture of sailors, soldiers, and those belonging to the humblest grade of life, the present assembly was composed of the very flower of Marseille society, magistrates who had resigned their office during the usurper's reign, officers who had deserted from the imperial army and joined forces with Condé, and the younger members of families brought up to hate and execrate the man whom five years of exile would convert into a martyr and fifteen of restoration elevate to the rank of a god. The guests were still at table, and the heat and an energetic conversation that prevailed betrayed the violent and vindictive passions that then agitated each dweller of the south, where unhappily for five centuries religious strife had long given increased bitterness to the violence of party feeling. The emperor, now king of the petty island of Elba, after having held sovereign sway over one half of the world, counting as his subjects a small population of five or six thousand souls, after having been accustomed to hear the vive Napoleons of a hundred and twenty millions of human beings uttered in ten different languages, was looked upon here as a ruined man, separated forever from any fresh connection with France or claim to her throne. The magistrates freely discussed their political views. The military part of the company talked unreservedly of Moscow and Leipzig, while the women commented on the divorce of Josephine. It was not over the downfall of the man, but over the defeat of the Napoleonic idea that they rejoiced, and in this they foresaw for themselves the bright and cheering prospect of a revivified political existence. An old man, decorated with the cross of Saint Louis, now rose and proposed the health of King Louis XVIII. It was the Marquis de saint Méran, this toast recalling at once the patient exile of Hartwell and the peace-loving King of France excited universal enthusiasm. Glasses were elevated in the air à l'anglais, and the ladies, snatching their bouquet from their fair bosoms, strewed the table with their floral treasures. In a word, an almost poetical fervor prevailed. Ah, said the Marquise de saint Méran, a woman with a stern forbidding eye, though still noble and distinguished in appearance, despite her fifty years. Ah, these revolutionists, who have driven us from those very possessions they afterwards purchased for a mere trifle during the reign of terror, would be compelled to own, were they hear that all true devotion was on our side, since we were content to follow the fortunes of a falling monarch, while they, on the contrary, made their fortune by worshipping the rising sun. Yes, yes, they could not help admitting that the king, for whom we sacrifice rank, wealth, and station, was truly our Louis the Well-Beloved, while their wretched usurper has been and ever will be, to them their evil genius, their Napoleon the Accursed. Am I not right, Villefort? I beg your pardon, madame. I really must pray you to excuse me. But, in truth, I was not attending to the conversation. Marquise, Marquise, interposed the old nobleman who had proposed the toast. Let the young people alone. Let me tell you, on one's wedding day, they are more agreeable subjects of conversation than dry politics. Never mind, dearest mother, said a young and lovely girl, with a profusion of light brown hair, and eyes that seemed to float in liquid crystal. Tis all my fault for seizing upon Monsieur de Villefort, so as to prevent his listening to what you said. But there, now take him. He is your own for as long as you like, Monsieur Villefort. I beg to remind you, my mother speaks to you. If the Marquise will deign to repeat the words I but imperfectly caught, I shall be delighted to answer, said M. de Villefort. Never mind, René, replied the Marquise, with a look of tenderness that seemed out of keeping with her harsh, dry features. But, however all other feelings may be withered in a woman's nature, there is always one bright, smiling spot in the desert of her heart, and that is the shrine of maternal love. I forgive you. What I was saying, Villefort, was that the Bonapartists had not our sincerity, enthusiasm, or devotion. They had, however, what supplied the place of those fine qualities, replied the young man, and that was fanaticism. Napoleon is the Mahomet of the West, and is worshipped by his commonplace but ambitious followers, not only as a leader and lawgiver, but also as the personification of equality. He, cried the Marquise, Napoleon the type of equality, for mercy's sake, then, what would you call Robespierre? Come, come, do not strip the latter of his just rights to bestow them on the Corsican, who, to my mind, has usurped quite enough. 
Nay, madame, I would place each of these heroes on his right pedestal, that of Robespierre on his scaffold in the Place Louis XV, that of Napoleon on the column of the Place Vendôme. The only difference consists in the opposite character of the equality advocated by these two men. One is the equality that elevates, the other is the equality that degrades. One brings a king within reach of the guillotine, the other elevates the people to a level with the throne. Observe, said Villefort, smiling, I do not mean to deny that both these men were revolutionary scoundrels, and that the ninth Thermidor and the 4th of April in the year 1814 were lucky days for France, worthy of being gratefully remembered by every friend to monarchy and civil order, and that explains how it comes to pass that, fallen as I trust he is for ever, Napoleon has still retained a train of parasitical satellites. Still, Marquise, it has been so with other usurpers. Cromwell, for instance, who was not half so bad as Napoleon, had his partisans and advocates. Do you know, Villefort, that you are talking in a most dreadfully revolutionary strain? But I excuse it. It is impossible to expect the son of a Girondin to be free from a small spice of the old leaven. A deep crimson suffused the countenance of Villefort. "'Tis true, madame,' answered he, "'that my father was a Girondin, but he was not among the number of those who voted for the king's death. He was an equal sufferer with yourself during the reign of terror, and had well nigh lost his head on the same scaffold on which your father perished. "'True,' replied the Marquis, without wincing in the slightest degree at the tragic remembrance thus called up. "'But bear in mind, if you please,' that our respective parents underwent persecution and proscription from diametrically opposite principles, in proof of which I may remark that while my family remained among the stanchest adherents of the exiled princes, your father lost no time in joining the new government, and that while the citizen Noirtier was a Girondin, the Count Noirtier became a senator. Dear mother, interposed René, you know very well it was agreed that all these disagreeable reminiscences should forever be laid aside. Suffer me also, madame, replied Villefort, to add my earnest request to Mademoiselle de Mérance, that you will kindly allow the veil of oblivion to cover and conceal the past. What avails recrimination over matters wholly past recall? I have laid aside even the name of my father, and altogether disowned his political principles. He was, nay, probably may still be, a Bonapartist, and is called Noirtier, I, on the contrary, am a stand royalist, and style myself de Villefort. Let what may remain of revolutionary sap exhaust itself and die away with the old trunk, and condescend only to regard the young shoot which has started up at a distance from the parent tree, without having the power, any more than the wish, to separate entirely from the stock from which it sprung. Bravo, Villefort, cried the Marquis. Excellently well said. Come now. I have hopes of obtaining what I have been for years endeavouring to persuade the Marquise to promise, namely a perfect amnesty and forgetfulness of the past. With all my heart, replied the Marquise, let the past be for ever forgotten. I promise you it affords me as little pleasure to revive it as it does you. All I ask is that Villefort will be firm and inflexible for the future in his political principles. Remember also, Villefort, that we have pledged ourselves to his majesty for your filthy and strict loyalty, and that, at our recommendation, the king consented to forget the past, as I do. And here she extended to him her hand, as I now do at your entreaty. But bear in mind that should there fall in your way any one guilty of conspiring against the government, you will be so much the more bound to visit the offence with rigorous punishment, as it is known you belong to a suspected family. Alas, madame, returned Villefort, my profession as well as the times in which we live compels me to be severe. I have already successfully conducted several public prosecutions and brought the offenders to merited punishment, but we have not done with the thing yet. Do you indeed think so? inquired the Marquise. I am at least fearful of it. Napoleon, in the island of Elba, is too near France, and his proximity keeps up the hopes of his partisans. Marseilles is filled with half-prey officers, who are daily, under one frivolous pretext or another, getting off quarrels with the royalists. From hence arise continual and fatal duels among the highest classes of persons, 
and assassinations in the lower. You have heard, perhaps, said the Comte de Salvieux, one of Monsieur de Meran's oldest friends, and trembling to the Comte d'Artois, that the Holy Alliance purposed removing him from thence. Yes, they were talking about it when we left Paris, said Monsieur de Saint Meran. And where is it decided to transfer him? To St. Helena. For heaven's sake, where is that? asked the Marquise. An island situated on the other side of the equator, at least two thousand leagues from here, replied the Count. So much the better. As Villefort observes, it is a great act of folly to have left such a man between Corsica, where he was born, and Naples, of which his brother-in-law is king, and face to face with Italy, the sovereignty of which he coveted for his son. Unfortunately, said Villefort, there are the treaties of 1814, and we cannot molest Napoleon without breaking those compacts. Oh, well, we shall find some way out of it, responded M. de Salvieux. There wasn't any trouble over treaties when it was a question of shooting the poor Duc d'Anguien. Well, said the Marquise, it seems probable that, by the aid of the Holy Alliance, we shall be rid of Napoleon, and we must trust to the vigilance of M. de Villefort to purify Marseille of his partisans. The king is either a king or no king. If he be acknowledged a sovereign of France, he should be upheld in peace and tranquillity and this can best be effected by employing the most inflexible agents to put down every attempt at conspiracy. Tis the best and surest means of preventing mischief. Unfortunately, madame, answered Villefort, the strong arm of the law is not called upon to interfere until the evil has taken place. Then all he has got to do is to endeavor to repair it. Nay, madame, the law is frequently powerless to effect this, all it can do is to avenge the wrong done. Oh, Monsieur de Villefort, cried a beautiful young creature, daughter to the Comte de Salvieux, and a cherished friend of Mademoiselle de saint Méran. Do try and get up some famous trial while we are at Marseille. I never was in a law court. I am told it is so very amusing. Amusing? Certainly, replied the young man, inasmuch as instead of shedding tears at the fictitious tale of woe produced at the theatre, you behold in a law court a case of real and genuine distress, a drama of life. The prisoner whom you dare see pale, agitated, and alarmed, instead of, as is the case when a curtain falls on a tragedy, going home to sup peacefully with his family, and then retiring to rest, that he may recommence his mimic woes on the morrow, is removed from your sight merely to be reconducted to his prison and delivered up to the executioner. I leave you to judge how far your nerves are calculated to bear you through such a scene. Of this, however, be assured, that should any favorable opportunity present itself, I will not fail to offer you the choice of being present. For shame, Monsieur de Villefort, said René, becoming quite pale. Don't you see how you're frightening us? And yet you laugh. What would you have? Tis like a duel. I have already recorded sentence of death five or six times, against the movers of political conspiracies, and who can say how many daggers may be ready sharpened, and only awaiting a favorable opportunity to be buried in my heart. Gracious heavens, Monsieur de Villefort, said René, becoming more and more terrified. You surely are not in earnest. Indeed I am, replied the young magistrate with a smile, and in the interesting trial that young lady is anxious to witness, the case would only be still more aggravated. Suppose, for instance, the prisoner, as is more than probable, to have served under Napoleon, well, can you expect for an instant that one accustomed, at the word of his commander, to rush fearlessly on the very bayonets of his foe, will scruple more to drive a stiletto into the heart of one he knows to be his personal enemy, than to slaughter his fellow creature, merely because bidden to do so by one he is bound to obey? Besides, one requires the excitement of being hateful in the eyes of the accused, in order to lash oneself into a state of sufficient vehemence and power. I would not choose to see the man against whom I pleaded smile, as though in mockery of my words. No, my pride is to see the accused pale, agitated, and as though beaten out of all composure by the fire of my eloquence. René uttered a smothered exclamation. Bravo, cried one of the guests, that is what I call talking to some purpose. 
"'Just the person we require at a time like the present,' said a second. "'What a splendid business that last case of yours was, my dear Villefort,' remarked a third. "'I mean the trial of the man for murdering his father. "'Upon my word, you killed him ere the executioner had laid his hand upon him.' "'Oh, as for parasites and such dreadful people as that,' interposed René, "'it matters very little what is done to them.' but as regards poor unfortunate creatures whose only crime consists in having mixed themselves up in political intrigues, why, that is the very worst offence they could possibly commit. For don't you see, René, the king is the father of his people, and he who shall plot or contrive aught against the life and safety of the parent of thirty-two million of souls is a parasite upon a fearfully great scale. I don't know anything about that, replied René, but Monsieur de Villefort, you have promised me, have you not, always to show mercy to those I plead for. Make yourself quite easy on that point, answered Villefort, with one of his sweetest smiles. You and I will always consult upon our verdicts. My love, said the Marquise, attend to your doves, your lapdogs, and embroidery, but do not meddle with what you do not understand. Nowadays the military profession is in abeyance, and a magisterial robe is the badge of honor. There is a wise Latin proverb that is very much in point. Sedant armatoge, said Villefort with a bow. I cannot speak Latin, responded the Marquise. Well, said René, I cannot help regretting you had not chosen some other profession than your own. A physician, for instance. Do you know I always felt a shudder at the idea of even a destroying angel? Dear good René, whispered Villefort, as he gazed with unutterable tenderness on the lovely speaker. Let us hope, my child, cried the Marquis, that Monsieur de Villefort may prove the moral and political physician of this province. If so, he will have achieved a noble work, and one which will go far to efface the recollection of his father's conduct, added the incorrigible Marquise. Madame, replied Villefort with a mournful smile, I have already had the honour to observe that my father has, at least I hope so, abjured his past errors, and that he is, at the present moment, a firm and zealous friend of the religion and order, a better royalist, possibly, than his son, for he has to atone for past dereliction, while I have no other impulse than warm, decided preference and conviction. Having made this well-turned speech, Villefort looked carefully round to mark the effect of his oratory, much as he would have done had he been addressing the bench in open court. "'Do you know, my dear Villefort,' cried the Comte de Salvieux, that is exactly what I myself said the other day at the Tuileries, when questioned by His Majesty's principal chamberlain touching the singularity of an allegiance between the son of a Girondin and the daughter of an officer of the Duc de Condé. And I assure you he seemed fully to comprehend that this mode of reconciling political differences was based upon sound and excellent principles. Then the king, who, without our suspecting it, had overheard our conversation, interrupted us by saying, Villefort, Observe that the king did not pronounce the word Nortier, but, on the contrary, placed considerable emphasis on that of Villefort. Villefort, said His Majesty, is a young man of great judgment and discretion, who will be sure to make a figure in his profession. I like him much, and it gave me great pleasure to hear that he was about to become the son-in-law of the Marquis and Marquise de saint méran I should myself have recommended the match, had not the noble Marquis anticipated my wishes by requesting my consent to it. Is it possible the king could have condescended so far as to express himself so favorably of me? asked the enraptured Villefort. I give you his very words, and if the Marquis chooses to be candid, he will confess that they perfectly agree with what His Majesty said to him when he went six months ago to consult him upon the subject of your espousing his daughter. That is true, answered the Marquis. How much do I owe this gracious prince? What is there I would not do to evince my earnest gratitude? That is right, cried the Marquise. I love to see you thus. Now then, were a conspirator to fall into your hands, he would be most welcome. For my part, dear mother, interposed René, I trust your wishes will not prosper, and that Providence will only permit petty offenders, poor debtors, and miserable cheats to fall into Monsieur de Villefort's hands. Then I shall be contented, just the same as though you prayed that a physician might only be called upon to prescribe for headaches, measles, and a string of wasp, or any other slight affection of the epidermis. If you wish to see me, the king's attorney, 
you must desire for me some of those violent and dangerous diseases from the cure of which so much honor redounds to the physician at this moment and as though the utterance of villefort's wish had sufficed to effect its accomplishment a servant entered the room and whispered a few words in his ear villefort immediately rose from table and quitted the room upon the plea of urgent business he soon however returned his whole face beaming with delight rene regarded him with fond affection and certainly his handsome features lit up as they then were with more than usual fire and animation seemed formed to excite the innocent admiration with which she gazed on her graceful and intelligent lover you were wishing just now said villefort addressing her that i were a doctor instead of a lawyer well i at least resemble the disciples of Eusculapius, in one thing that of not being able to call a day my own not even that of my betrothal and wherefore were you called away just now asked mademoiselle de saint meran with an air of deep interest for a very serious matter which bids fair to make work for the executioner how dreadful exclaimed rene turning pale is it possible burst simultaneously from all who were near enough to the magistrate to hear his words why if my information proved correct a sort of bonaparte conspiracy had just been discovered can i believe my ears cried the marquise i will read you the letter containing the accusation at least said villefort the king's attorney is informed by a friend to the throne and the religious institutions of his country that one named edmond dantes mate of the ship pharaon this day arrived from smyrna after having touched at naples and porto ferraro has been the bearer of a letter from murat to the usurper and again taken charge of another letter from the usurper to the bonapartist club in paris ample corroboration of this statement may be obtained by arresting the above-mentioned edmond dantes who either carries the letter for paris about with him or has it at his father's abode should it not be found in the possession of father or son then it will assuredly be discovered in the cabin belonging to the said dantes on board the pharaon but said rene this letter which after all is but an anonymous scrawl is not even addressed to you but to the king's attorney true but that gentleman being absent his secretary by his orders opened his letters thinking this one of importance he sent for me but not finding me took upon himself to give the necessary orders for arresting the accused party then the guilty person is absolutely in custody said the marquise nay my dear mother say the accused person you know we cannot yet pronounce him guilty he is in safe custody answered villefort and rely upon it if the letter is found he will not be likely to be trusted abroad again unless he goes forth under the special protection of the headsman and where is the unfortunate being asked rene he is at my house come come my friend interrupted the marquise do not neglect your duty to linger with us you are the king's servant and must go wherever that service calls you oh villefort cried rene clasping her hands and looking toward her lover with piteous earnestness be merciful on this day of our betrothal the young man passed round to the side of the table where the fair pleader sat and leaning over her chair said tenderly to give you pleasure my sweet rene i promise you to show all the lenity in my power but if the charges brought against this bonapartist hero prove correct why then you really must give me leave to order his head to be cut off rene shuddered never mind that foolish girl villefort said the marquise she will soon get over these things so saying madame de saint meran extended her dry bony hand to villefort who while imprinting a son-in-law's respectful salute on it looked at rene as much as to say i must try and fancy tis your dear hand i kiss as it should have been these are mournful auspices to accompany a betrothal sighed poor rene upon my words child exclaimed the angry marquise your folly exceeds all bounds i should be glad to know what connection there can possibly be between your sickly sentimentality and the affairs of state oh mother murmured rene nay madame i pray you pardon this little traitor i promise you that to make up for her want of loyalty i will be most inflexibly severe then casting an expressive glance at his betrothed 
which seemed to say, Fear not, for your dear sake my justice shall be tempered with mercy. And receiving a sweet and approving smile in return, Villefort quitted the room. End of chapter 6